Good morning. Steve Stites here at the University of Kansas Health System in the Dolph mm -hmm. uh, Simons uh, 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 Family Studio and uh, welcome you to this cold, snowy Friday here in April in Kansas City. Mm, it's bad. Yeah, that's kind of a funny deal. You know, COVID's bad enough, but to get snow on April the 17th or whatever today is good golly, Miss Molly. So we are, we are joined today by uh, uh, Senator Jerry Moran, a good friend of the University of Kansas Health System and a great friend of Kansas who is here, um, I think. I don't know if you're from your home today or from uh, D.C., Senator. Uh, I guess we'll find that out in just a minute. As well as Lee Norman, uh, Dr. Lee, Nor Lee Norman, who is the secretary at KDHE. Senator Moran, are you with us? Are you there? Uh, Dr. Stites, I am here, live from the uh, basement of the Moran Hall. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I know you're getting good care there. So uh, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing fine, thank you. Thanks for asking, and uh, hope uh, camp are doing uh, better every day. Great. And uh, Dr. Norman, are you there? Yes, I am. I'm in my office. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good. And, of course, I have Hawkeye here, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, and Michelle is our interpreter this morning. So thank you all for joining us. Senator, let's turn to you first. Uh, what words of wisdom do you have and thoughts that you would like our, our listening audience to hear? Well, uh, there's certainly a significant increase in the amount of uh, conversations about a path forward uh, as far as uh, the isolation, uh, the stay-at-home orders. been a topic of conversation uh, in Kansas but across the country. Uh, yesterday, Trump held a telephone conference call uh, with Republican and Democrat members of the United States Senate in which uh, he indicated that they were working on a plan uh, to present as a guideline for states and communities to utilize. Uh, and there was a bit of uh, that uh, release last night just brought in broad terms. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what... Uh, the, the doctors on this program have to say a, about it, but it appeared to me to be something that is uh, reasonably uh, common sense. Uh, and I think the major point, uh, communities, localities, states uh, are all different. And that's been one of my views uh, for a long time is that Washington, D.C. is not a person to make perfect decisions for every place in the country. And so a lot of uh, necessity, in my view, in, in is, but certainly in this one, as we look at uh, how we return to a more normal state, uh, that decisions be made uh, closer to home uh, than all of them being made in Washington, D.C. And so guidelines uh, that uh, seem to be developing, um, again, I'll, I'll see what the pr medical professionals have to say this morning, but that's a development. And I would indicate that uh, I also had a personal call with the president, plus a number of my colleagues one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, throughout the last week, uh, and I continue to promote uh, testing. I think it's one of the ways that we can move more rapidly to get things back to normal and less, less isolation than what we have today. We need more information about more people, and uh, a goal of ours should be, uh, should be testing. Uh, the, the president did uh, appoint me, uh, choose me to serve on a task force of, of members of Congress as we look at getting out of uh, the current state uh, and I look forward to providing advice based upon what's going on in Kansas uh, to that effort. And we thank you for your service and thank you for those efforts. And I know as we won't be sheltering in place forever that maybe you'll get out of the basement finally. I'm hoping. Uh, uh, yes, I, don't, I no longer know what the reason is that I'm in the basement. But uh, <laughs> I'm reluctant to, to, to perhaps to find out. We never do. All right. Dr. Norman. Um, thoughts that you have, especially in reference to Senator Moran's comments, or uh, thoughts of, uh, that, that you also have? Sure. <clears throat> yeah, Lee Norman here. Uh, well, it's kind of a story, you know, good news and the bad news. The, we, as Senator Moran points out, we've been sorely lacking in testing supplies. Uh, we, there's no serology blood testing yet available that's FDA approved, um, and that will be one of the things that will help to be one piece of the puzzle. It alone won't uh, be sufficient testing. We'll still rely heavily on the antigen testing, the nasal swabs, and and, uh, and then to do more intense con contact tracing, either those people that have the illness and then those people kind of in a ring around them. Think of it that way. Uh, we you saw, might have seen that there's a couple of rankings that have us, Kansas, uh, 50th out of 50 states on a per capita basis for testing. And I assure you, and the Others said it's not like we're hoarding uh, testing supplies or selling them on the black market or something. We are using everything we're getting in the door. 
Uh, fortunately, there's commercial labs, there's hospital labs that have stood up, although the hospital labs have the same difficulty getting the testing materials. That has absolutely been the rate limiting factor. The good news is that uh, we're not doing too bad as a state. When you look at the d number of deaths per capita, uh, we're better than 33 states, so we're in the top 17 in the country. And on hospital hospitalizations per capita, we're about the middle of the pack. So again, as per Senator Moran, we do need to uptick the amount of testing so we can earlier identify and then, uh, but the, you know, you can test till the cows come home, but that doesn't do any good unless you do something about it. And that's why we're bringing on 400 additional people to do contact tracing for earlier quarantine isolation of those people that we find through uh, enhanced uh, testing. We do have seven counties that were brought online for community testing. Um, the, Here's a very well. The, new, the newest ones will be uh, in uh, Finney County starting uh, Monday and Thomas County starting today. So Colby and Garden City, and they'll be picking up tests from uh, quite a number of western counties. And I think that's great news. I think the contact tracing is especially good news uh, because as we look at reopening society, our ability to um, help with any sort of microwave or micro surge in different areas and different communities will be totally dependent, I think, on that, Dr. Norman. Yeah, it will be. And see, that's a major philosophical switch because now we've been doing um, all the the testing has been ill people. And don't get me wrong, that's critically important, both to test an ill person and then those people around that person and those people around that those people that if they are indeed positive. Uh, but the when you go to do community testing, then it's a major shift that you're testing well people to find out the burden of disease. We've done a little bit of this in the state, and and there is one instance with testing just very mildly ill people in a single county. We did 250 uh, tests and came up with eight positive people that really didn't look ill like uh, ill like they had coronavirus, but they tested positive. Eight out of 235 is a small number, but when you think about the ability of that virus to spread, if indeed each one of those is spreading virus, then that would be quite a number of uh, people that they could. Well, and then. And so, and so just to, that. that's actually a really important thing, because if you if, if we have that works out to around three percent, if my math's right, of the people in that area were po that would have been the community prevalence, which is higher than I think we would have expected, especially in maybe in a more rural area. Now, again, these were mildly symptomatic. Yeah. Okay. So, so a it's, a, it's a bias. Yeah, selection bias, you bet. So where, where uh, uh, Secretary, where do you think we are on the curve? Oh, um. You know, if you look at the rolling three-day average, it, it's it's a slightly negative, a, 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 a encouraging trend. If you look at a rolling three-day average, uh, certainly the hospital beds aren't as full as they used to be. Have we rounded the top of the peak and then on the back hill slide for uh, 14 days? We're not there yet. Hence the reason for the governor's extension of the uh, stay-home um, uh, order until the third of midnight on the May May third. Uh, but I, I'm optimistic. We, our modeling has been spot on, yeah. in terms of where we thought we'd be. So I'm, I'm optimistic that at the end of um, this month is when we'll truly see the peak and then start to to improve after that. Dana, as we look at these points, where where are we here at KU today, and and what's your sense about this question of reopening, and mm -hmm. and what do people need to do? What do, what do we need to do? To yeah, think about that. So many questions. First of all, at KU, um, I would echo Senator Moran's comments. We have uh, been somewhat stable as far as number of new admissions, number of discharges. Currently, we have 36 patients positive for COVID in-house. 15 of those are in the ICU. So our, our numbers are not, are not changing too much. As far as when we open, uh, you know, we certainly echo um, Dr. Fauci and, and Dr. Norman. You know, this virus spreads with just such high efficiency. It's hyper contagious almost. We don't know the full prevalence. Um, in the community, but how quickly it spreads. Um, opening, we definitely need to open. We, we need to get the economy back. We need to get people working. We need to try and help the people that are staying at home so they can get out. Um, it does have to be in a very uh, timed and, and protocol-like measure because, you know, you take your foot off, off the gas and this, uh, this virus, this infection could spread like wildfire. And although we are doing really well with PPE right now and ventilators and hospital beds, um, 
if there is an explosion and an exponential growth, growth of infections, um, we could be overwhelmed very quickly. And just to say, I think um, I'm going to echo those comments, but first I want to point out about Hawkeye here. You know, um, there's the Jimmy Kimmel uh, deal that's happening this weekend, um, this, this special called One World on, on the 18th at 7 p.m. It is a star-studded event with all sorts of people, and it's in, it kind of in to help out there supporting healthcare workers and others involved in the front lines, first responders, etc. And and I say star-studded, but it has Dana Hawkinson in it. Right. I understand that you are to follow like Lady Gaga and Stevie Wonder, yeah. and that you're going to be in this as Hawkeye, um, <laughs> our own Hawkeye, that is, and you're the first medical interview. So a shout out to Dana uh, and also to encourage folks to take a look at that. I think it'll be on all major stations and it's going to be live streamed and it's going to be shown all over the world. So that that's a big deal and, and, and really a good sign of p folks coming together around this. So and I just to back to Senator Moran's earlier question, you know, this is a balancing act, right? No matter how we look at this, this is a balancing act between making sure people stay employed, which, man, that's good for your health and um, trying to stay safe from the coronavirus. So. When we do reopen society, the rules around infection control have not changed. Nope. And that is the behavior you have to keep. you got to wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Cough into your elbow and maintain social distancing. Those are the reasons we've been able to try to, we've started to bend the curve. If we reopen and people don't follow that and they act like they can do just as yep. they did two months ago, then we will still see a surge yeah. because the number of people who have been affected in our area is still very low. It's probably around at one or two or three percent. So that means 97 percent of the people haven't been affected yet. But we have to go back to work and, mm -hmm. and, and totally understand that. But please do that in a way that maintains those basic infection control principles. So, Senator, in response to your question, do we reopen the economy? I am not. I'm a health care provider, right. and I don't, I'm, I'm not probably the right one to say when, when is the right time. Clearly, we're going to have to, uh, as, a, as a citizen and a personal just a, an individual, man, I, I have friends who have lost their jobs, and mm -hmm. I, we, we, we can't stay sheltered in place forever. But what it has done is to allow us to build up enough PPE yeah. and enough expertise and disseminate the knowledge and be much better prepared for a surge than we were six or eight weeks ago. There is no question it has worked to our benefit. Now it's up to each individual person to exercise good personal responsibility, to make sure they follow the rules of infection control and help take care of themselves by doing that and which will take care of each other. That's got to be the message. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be reopening with personal responsibility. That is the key yeah. to a successful, I think, a successful outcome. And in the meantime, we're starting to see, Dana, some good news from different trials. Um, I think there was one yesterday about remdesivir that, that, that came out. Thoughts about those? Yeah, I think that um, now there was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine. I think there was some also anecdotal responses from physicians on the front line treating with remdesivir. Certainly, um, right now, we aren't able to use that drug, it's compassionate use only from the manufacturer, but we, I think we really need a direct acting antiviral, and that's what remdesivir is. Something like Tamiflu for influenza, it acts directly on the virus, and I think that is where, um, if we do get a good therapy, that is probably our best shot. Now, we have other things that we're working on as well. Um, there's obviously, everybody knows about hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil. There is the convalescent sera, meaning people who've been infected can donate plasma, and we can try to take some of those uh, healthy antibodies and, and other uh, cytokines and chemicals from after recovery and use that to treat. Um, so hopefully our knowledge is, is getting better day by day and actually probably moving at light speed compared to past epidemics and past infections. Yeah. Questions from our media friends out there. Um, hi, this is Shannon O'Brien at Fox 4 News. And since it's allergy season, I wanted to know if you all could touch on um, you know, the symptoms of COVID-19 versus allergy symptoms. Some of them are similar, I understand, and some are different. Dana? Yeah, uh, the CDC website has a very good infographic about this. You know, it is true. It's unfortunately, it's allergy season. Uh, allergy season, allergies probably are typically not going to cause the uh, fever, the shortness of breath, the chest pain. Also, if you've had seasonal allergies in the past, you understand what it's like. You're probably going to be taking some allergy medicine. Um, 
the other symptoms that we're also looking for uh, that have been touted are you know diarrhea, muscle aches. Um, also, we've also heard in anecdotal, or even up to 30%, maybe people losing the ability to smell. So there's all those symptoms which are quite different than people with just typical regular allergies. Other questions? What would you say to folks who are sitting home and they're coughing and they're not sure, um, you know, what it is? They should allergies or COVID. Right. They need yeah. to call their primary yep. care physician, and, and if mm -hmm. they'll do some screening questions, because if they if there's any real sign, then they should go and get tested. Yep. You know, what, one of the things that has happened because of limiting testing back, limited testing back to Senator Moran and and, and Lee and, and, and Secretary Norman, was that we weren't able to test people like that unless you're coming into the hospital. As we get more testing availability, then I think we'll be able to loosen those criteria and test a lot more frequently. That's really important for us to understand how the disease is acting in the public and, and, and what we need to do. And, and uh, so lots of uh, appreciation for the support of Senator Moran and working so hard to get more testing and to Lee Norman. Hey, and if, hey, if you're on the line not talking, make sure you're muting so that we, uh, we, we don't hear everything. So uh, another qu other questions? I've got a question about uh, response from... Um, I, I guess anger-filled response. This is Taylor Channel 41 in Kansas City, uh, and I'd be really interested in, in any of your responses here because uh, I have people still responding to things that I put out on social media from these calls or from other interviews that I do. I'm going to read directly one uh, response I got. Less folks die from corona flu than seasonal flu, but journalists don't make that comparison. They're just trying to scare people. I don't know if anger is ramping back up because stay-at-home orders are being pushed back, but I'm interested in um, any of your responses to that kind of that kind of rhetoric we're seeing from a lot of people that it, it's still not as bad as the flu. I think that's a pretty common thing that people are trying to continue to push, and, and I'm curious about what your responses are to that. I'm going to start with that, but I'm going to turn it over to Senator Moran and, and to um, Secretary Norman. Um, you know, the flu has a, a death rate of about 0.5%. Um, Right now in the United States, we don't know the death rate because we don't know what the percentage of, we don't know how many people in the public are affected. But I, I will tell you, uh, I have been in pulmonary and critical care medicine for um, approximately a very long time. Um, it, it, it's been about 30 years. I've seen a lot of patients with in influenza, have lived through a lot of influenza uh, outbreaks. Um, we don't see this number of admissions coming into the hospital with influenza, nor do we see anywhere near this number of deaths from influenza of people who came into the, uh, into the hospital. It is not comparable. Now, it is true that to date we've seen, I don't remember the exact number to that right now in the United States, about 20,000 or so deaths or 25,000. Um, and influenza took about 22,000 lives last year. But we're still at the tip of the iceberg for COVID-19. So they are not comparable. It is not a fair comparison. And I think we have to say it just the way it is, Dana. Any other thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the mortality or the case fatality rate, let's be clear, case fatality rate is probably has been shown up to be 20 times that of flu. This is not influenza. This is not HIV. We do have vaccine for influenza. We do have treatment for influenza. Some of those deaths with influenza are also because of secondary bacterial infection, bacterial pneumonia. We don't really see that. But as we talked about the efficacy which which this spreads, um, the number of people affected, and when all of those people are coming to the hospital, or even a small percentage of those people are coming to the hospital and critically ill, that is when you have an overwhelming of your health care resources, overwhelming of your beds, your ventilators, your PPE, your drugs to keep the patients comfortable when they are on the ventilators. That doesn't happen with flu, and it doesn't happen all at once either. So, so those distinctions need to be made. This disease is not influenza. Uh, even though it's an infectious disease, um, it's just totally different. Yeah, it's, it, they aren't comparable. But, no. Senator Moran, I, I, it's got to be hard sitting in, in, in your position and knowing that, gosh, we have to take care of people, but we also clearly have to reopen the economy. And I, my, you, know, you, you see protests in Michigan and where, wherever. And, and the, the, talk to us about how you strike that balance, because that, that as, a, as an important leader to Kansas, that, that's got to feel like a pretty big responsibility. Well, thank you. It, I mean, it is. It's a, it is the topic of conversation among members of Congress. Uh, it is the topic of conversation to the public. 
there is an angst uh, about how long is this going to last. Uh, I think it's important to note, uh, and, and I think this may have been said, but the way I would say it is uh, we have, when we compare the number of deaths from influenza, uh, that is something that as it reached its peak, we knew what those numbers are, and we're not at a peak yet, at exactly. least according to you experts. So we can't make that comparison saying this is how many died then. We don't know what the consequence is here. And that uncertainty is, uh, is significant in our health care. Uh, it's also uh, significant in our economic circumstances. People are struggling, uh, and uh, I represent a state in which uh, many businesses, their margins are pretty minimal, uh, and often uh, they're struggling to stay in business to begin with. And you add this to the circumstance, and unfortunately, particularly in rural Kansas, but really across our state, the businesses that we lose uh, may never return. Uh, and so there is this economic side, and, and I guess I also would say that as someone who is appropriating taxpayer dollars to fight COVID-19 uh, and its consequences, those sort resources are not unlimited, uh, particularly with a, uh, an economy that is not generating tax revenues. Our ability to keep up the level of support that uh, the federal taxpayers are providing uh, it can't go on forever. And so a measured re uh, approach is what I heard you all say earlier, but people are anxious to return to something normal. And I would go back to testing. I think there's a set of people out there who, if uh, the president or the governor says it's safe to return, uh, they will return to work. But there's also a lot of people out there who are still going to be wondering, uh, is it really safe? And if I make a mistake, what, what are the consequences to my kids or the the neighbors next door, or my parents, if I go see them. Uh, and so that, in my view, is where testing uh, takes uh, a, a, a high priority, uh, deserves a high priority, uh, because the certainty that we can take with even the experts, uh, when Dr. Norman or Dr. Fauci says that it's safe to return, they have a credibility uh, that, but still people are going to have doubts. No offense, Dr. Norman. People want to know in their own circumstance where they are. And so to get us back to a level of comfort, a level of confidence, testing becomes all the more important as we wait for a vaccine. And uh, I would say that uh, I learned this morning from NIH, the National Institute of Health, that they will later this morning announce a cooperative effort between uh, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, FDA, CDC, the European Medicine Agency, uh, the, a dozen uh, biopharmaceutical companies uh, pooling their resources today uh, and uh, establishing protocols to move the process forward with development of a vaccine. Uh, and so we're putting uh, our best and brightest and a, and a lot of money. This last appropriation bill put a billion dollars into NIH's budget for purposes of vaccine development. And now the effort is being uh, made to combine uh, government agencies, uh, European uh, interests, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry to get us to a point in which that vaccine is available, uh, perhaps earlier than what we had, had expected. Well, that sounds like a remarkable effort. And you know, I think it's a sign of the times of people coming together that all that can happen in really a, a really short period of time. So thank you. Secretary Norman, opening Kansas. Um, you, I know you must be spending hours and hours on this every day, probably about 30 hours uh, per day, just looking at this question. Yeah, the, um, I, think we're, I think we're nibbling at the edges of what it really means, and that, one, our, our health care system has to be able to respond. Worst-case scenario, we open up um, and get people moving again, get businesses moving again. We have to make sure that we have sufficient hospital beds, sufficient testing capability, uh, any kind of treatments that are available. Uh, and we we did not, in the state of Kansas, any, become anywhere as close to uh, New York, for example, in terms of overly taxing. It, it got, it's very busy, don't get me wrong, um, but we still need to develop more beds. Senator Moran was helpful with, for me to make contact with Dr. Stone, the kind of second-in-command at the Veterans Administration. We have assurances that the VA stands ready to accept our patients and care for the patients if we need to use the VA as surge capacity. So I think one is making sure that we have the capacity by way of testing, treatment, and bed space, caregivers, and PPE. We're not quite there yet. Number two, um, 
testing uh, so that we understand where the disease is. Um, you, you know, I think one of the things that's humbling and important to remember uh, to the question we got just a minute ago is that we don't know this bug very well. Uh, we know that SARS in 03 and 04, a different coronavirus, fizzled out. This one ain't fizzling. We know that the coronavirus in the Middle East, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, it didn't peak out until year number four. Um, and now, seven years later, it's still grinding along with a very high fatality rate. But it has become the, quote, new normal in the Arabian Peninsula. When people come in with what looks like it might be influenza, they say it's either influenza or coronavirus, and they treat it because it's the new normal for them. We don't know if this is going to peak out till year four or if it's going to fizzle or if it's something in between. I think we're going to see it as a continuous problem. And, but uh, I think we do need to open up uh, and get more aggressive with um, things that, so we have a belt and suspenders when it comes to making sure that if there is a resurgence, and there will be a resurgence in the fall, um, I predict anyway, then uh, we are able to handle it. The people, as Steve Stites just said, they have to be, uh, their preparedness is everybody's individual responsibility. I, I just can't say that enough because we've, you know, I do think feel like we've bent the curve or flattened it here in, in Kansas. And, and to everybody's credit, uh, when you start not being sheltered at home and people move back into society, which we have to do, right? You can't stay and do this forever. It's not sustainable. So then you just have to wait to help continue to bend the curve so that our healthcare systems aren't overwhelmed is through personal responsibility. There is, until we have a vaccination or therapy, that's the choice we have. So, okay, other questions out there? Yeah, hello, uh, this is John Pepperstone over at Fox 4 News. I'd like to ask Senator Moran a question if he's available. Uh, again, following up on this restlessness we're seeing with specifically protests planned in both Kansas and Missouri next week, people saying that the stay at home orders have been extended uh, too far out. Uh, his thoughts about that? Well, I certainly understand the rest restlessness. We have been talking about that on this program, but it is a conversation I have with Kansans every day. Uh, I have been uh, doing teleconferences with people, uh, organizations, communities across our state uh, since uh, this began. And uh, I think there was a hope and an anticipation that this might be behind us or we could see the light at the end of the tunnel uh, by now and that uh, we could get back to whatever normal uh, soon may be. But I also think that people recognize, many people recognize that it is important that, that this personal responsibility, uh, not only does it protect the person, but it protects his or her family and their neighbors and their neighborhood and their community. So there is a, there, there's this clash about when is the right time and, um, again, we're trying to do everything we can to get us in a position to say now is the right time to open up opportunities for people to get out and about more than what we uh, are experiencing today. But it is going to be based upon science, medicine, availability of health care services. Uh, and uh, I understand Kansans in particular, and I don't think it's any different than, than Missourians, we don't like being told what to do. We don't like having our freedoms restricted. And we certainly don't like these instructions from government uh, and government far away, uh, as in Washington, D.C. So there is this natural dissatisfaction with the circumstances we're in. And people, in addition to worrying about their health, have to worry about taking care of their families. And while there's been significant financial efforts uh, made uh, in Kansas and across the country, the amount of money that the federal government is putting to try to alleviate not only the health care challenges, but the economic challenges that Americans face is significant and huge. And so those efforts are underway, but people are still worried. There's still people unemployed. There's still people who can't afford to pay their light bill or to, to buy uh, the groceries they need to care for their family. So we're going to experience this anxiety. And I think what's, what is taking place now that will be helpful to people who are demanding that uh, we open up government uh, sooner uh, or now, maybe that's the way of saying it, that the people who are insisting that it occur now, if we can put in place uh, a, a plan, an outline of what it is that is required so there is this light is seen at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's what President Trump uh, was doing, is doing, was doing yesterday uh, in his uh, press conference and his conversation with members of the United States Senate with his broad outline 
is we need to demonstrate that we understand, that elected officials, that politicians, that even the medical community understands that this is not a sustainable circumstance that we're, can continue indefinitely. And here's what we need to see, and here's the steps we need to take to get us to the point in which uh, that personal freedom uh, is restored. Senator, if I may, Are too. these protests or gatherings next week, are they a concern to you that it could be a result in a setback from the public health standpoint? Uh, again, I would encourage people not to gather. Uh, I, I'm all for public protest. Uh, it's part of our democracy, and people have every right to complain and suggest and, and encourage uh, government to do different things than what's being done. Um, or to support what's being done. But it ought not be done by the gathering in large crowds. And when it comes to plans being put in place for recovery, what do you make of your colleague in Missouri, Senator Hawley, is pushing this idea of the government subsidizing payrolls instead of having people laid off and file for unemployment so that workforces are sort of locked in place and you don't have to go through the unemployment process? Um, is, is it too late for that or, is that, or is that a potential solution in your view? And let's have this answer, and then we'll go to the next question from another reporter or from the, our audience. So. Uh, I'll, I'll answer quickly. I, I am studying what Senator Hawley uh, has proposed. Uh, he reached out to me yesterday or the day before, uh, but the concept that he is pursuing is something similar to what the, the program, the, the Small Business Administration Section 7 loan program, is trying to accomplish. Uh, and that's the, the, and been very very, I don't know, successful, I think successful is the right word, been very prevalent in Kansas and very successful with nearly $4 billion being put into loans that will be forgiven if, if businesses keep their employees employed. Keeping that relationship, both psychologically, uh, mental health-wise, but economically, keeping a relationship between a business and its employees uh, is hugely important at the same time providing income to those employees, whether they are at work or uh, at the workplace or not. Okay. Is there another person who has a question out there? Yeah, this is Shannon O'Brien with Fox 4 as well. And I'm, I'm going to follow up on John Pepitone's question, and I'd like to address it to the medical professionals. You know, there's a protest planned Monday in Kansas City, and their plan is to, quote, flood the streets of Kansas City to protest the extension of the stay-at-home order. So what are the medical implications to a large gathering like that if it does happen? You bet. It's a really bad idea. Um, you know, if you take a virus that's highly contagious and respirable and you, you want to open up society, is there a worse way to make your point than to make everybody sick? I mean, th 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 let's just be blunt about it because that's, that's the danger. And, and I think the problem is because we haven't had the New York surge, folks are getting a little overconfident about their ability to master it. But the reality is the virus is here. You know, we have um, 34 patients or 35 patients in beds this morning with coronavirus and with COVID-19. And all it takes is a few big gatherings, and that number will explode. The way to open up society is not to make everybody sick. The way to open up society is to exercise personal responsibility to be certain that you protect yourself protect your family, and protect everybody else. Otherwise, what happens is we'll be right back to a shelter in place because we'll be having overwhelmed hospital resources and it'll be like New York City. That is not where you want to be. So you've got to use good judgment. This is not a hoax. It is not made up. And it is not influenza. If you operate from that premise, any one of those three points, then you have the danger of making a whole lot of people sick and watching your loved ones die. Bad choice, folks. Bad choice. Yeah, I would echo that. You know, we have to understand, let's take healthcare workers out of this. You know, this is such highly infective. So if we go back and it opens up, what happens when our servers get it, when our bartenders, when our cooks get it, you know, when our heroes, the cashiers get it at our stores, when the delivery drivers who are delivering our goods get it, and those things shut down. And it's very real because we've already seen uh, meat, pla meat plants shutting down. So that's an already uh, kink in our supply chain. That could be very real on a larger scale. And so just think about it like that. If, even if you're not thinking about healthcare workers and hospitals, think about it just common everyday things that you're doing. Um, so it is a very real danger. And if you have really concerns, I would you know, either write a pen pal in New York or Detroit 
or down in Louisiana, they have been overwhelmed. And we do not want to become like New York. They have provided us very good lessons, and they have really been dealing with this and hopefully are coming through it. Yeah. Uh, but we and really need our, to protect ourselves. One of that. our physicians was in New York uh, and, and did, went up there to do service. We'll bring him on in the, onto our show and, and, let, and let him tell the story of what it's like there. Um, and again, it's a place where there's a, lot, a dense population. We're blessed with a smaller. Monday. Yeah, he'll be on on Monday. Um, Damien Stevens, and and so uh, we'll listen to that story. Listen to the story of what he saw in 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 the real world. So, Se- Secretary Norman, any other thoughts about this question? Um, a couple of thoughts to Shannon's question. Um, we have real world examples. We had a t- church gathering here in Kansas right. that uh, had 50 people infected, uh, six deaths, and they went to nine counties so far and with the illness and have uh, been, that's, that's how the spread occurred as per Dana's point. Uh, we had a husband and wife. The husband didn't go, the wife did. She came home and he died and she died. Uh, that's one church gathering and that's certainly much smaller than flooding the streets, I assure you. Uh, look at the packing plant, Dr. Hawkinson mentioned, in uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I believe, 546 infected uh, meat packers in there. They're not as close together as people packed together flooding the streets. This is not a theory. Um, it's It's been shown time and again, hence the need for the social distancing that's so critical to this. My son, by the way, he survived his infection with coronavirus in New York. He lives in Brooklyn. Um, he's a good observer of humankind. Uh, he, As he got better, finally, in it from his brown sitting by his window of his brownstone apartment, looking down at one of 45 semis that were refrigerated semis to haul bodies away. So here he is getting better from coronavirus, thank goodness, watching the loading of bodies, 45 semis in New York City. Yeah, Stark reminder. Well, it's, and it's just real. And we just have to say it's real. And how do we, how do we take care of each other? while we open society. We have to open society. We get that. I, I told the story yesterday. We've been going to St. Cleaners for 30 years or 25 years, and, and it closed, right? They don't have enough, uh, they don't have enough revenue to, to keep the doors open. That is the tragedy. There is so much fallout. So we, thought, we and even here in the hospital, you know, it's funny. You, you, not funny. You, you, you see the stories coming from New York about overwhelmed health care facilities. Hospitals throughout Kansas closed down their mm-hmm. elective surgeries, closed down their clinics, which means there's not a lot of revenue coming into them. Thankfully, the, uh, there is good uh, support coming from D.C. about uh, helping support our healthcare facilities, but it's not the same as our own revenue, um, and a lot of it we have to eventually pay back. Uh, that's fine, but you know we, we're in a position where we don't have a lot of patients, and we've closed those things down, so we don't have a lot of revenue. Now, if we simply say, let's go out and, and go back to take to the streets, then what happens is these same hospitals will get overwhelmed. And, and that's not the answer. The answer is to have a good, fair reopening of society. But the key from a healthcare profession standpoint is the same thing. It is about personal responsibility. And if we've been responsible enough to shelter at home and bend the curve, which we have, then we can be responsible enough to go back out into society in a way that will keep people safe. And get us back to get get employment and the economy going again. Mm-hmm. That's got to be the combination. So other questions? Thank you for those answers. Yeah. Hi. Uh, this is John Riley with the Sun. Um, and I was uh, just wondering, uh, in terms of reopening the economy, um, you know, we had a, an original stay home with end date set, but uh, that's been extended now. So is there... Uh, set criteria um, for, I think people might be wondering if this, the May 3rd, if that's really the end date of it or or what exact uh, numbers of, uh, of recovered uh, people or that kind of thing would need to be or if, if it's going to be extended again or not. And Secretary Norman, I think, um, as, as Sun Miranda said, this is something that's going to be decided a little bit more on a local level, and, and that makes sense to me because every state looks a little different. Kansas looks a lot different than New York. Tell, talk to us a little bit about how um, you're approaching it and how uh, um, Governor Kelly is, is, is looking at that. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it was extended to May 3rd, and in, Governor Kelly made it very clear in the press conference on Wednesday afternoon that in extending it to the 3rd, that might... The, the, the state 
executive order may be allowed to expire at that time, but that doesn't preclude county by county having the local authority to continue it. Goes back to Senator Moran's comment about testing. We'll have a. There are some counties. Uh, there's been I don't know 45 counties in Kansas that have not had any cases yet. Or, but then again, we have to admit that without more broad testing, there we don't know for sure that there haven't been. So um, what we would like to see, and it's not a unique thought. Many um, Dr. Fauci and others talked about a, a sustained reduction in cases uh, in a state or a region for 14 days. That's uh, 14 days picked because it's uh, thought to be the incubation period for the virus. And uh, obviously, during that 14-day period, there'll still be new cases. But we, what we want to see is a drop cons consistently to make sure that it's not just false hope by a day or two of improvement and then a resurgence. So I think that broadly, hold your, uh, hang your hat on 14 days of sustained reduction in new cases and then a county-by-county county evaluation whether to extend it or not. It, it wouldn't surprise me if individual counties would choose to extend it because of uh, a unique trend in their local area. All right. Why don't, why don't we have time? Why don't we have time for one more question, and then we'll go to wrapping up. So the last question, please. Hi, uh, this is for Dr. Norman. This is, uh, my name is Jackson Overshield with Take News. I, you mentioned how modeling is showing the peak being towards the end of the month. What does that peak look like, and how how much how soon after the, the, we hit the peak will there kind of be a drop off back to lower case numbers? Yeah, the um, as you know, modeling isn't perfect. Uh, it's the best we have, uh, and it gets and it does get better with every day. It was encouraging that the modeling we did had it uh, to the current numbers. Uh, we currently have a, uh, just short of 1,600 cases and 80 deaths. That was yesterday's numbers, and that was within that was within a percent or two of what our original modeling was done two or three weeks ago. Uh, so it will be an uptick from there, of course, um, and then um, uh, and then just a gradual drop off, and it'll tail off at. Um, at kind of the, like I said, over 14 days. In, in our modeling shows us at the end of that, just a single digit numbers of new cases per day. Um, that would, it's, that's somewhat of an optimistic view of it, but hopefully that's what will prevail. And, and I've, I've been corrected. We can go longer, Senator, I don't, Senator Moran, or do you have a little longer for us? Uh, I do. Okay. I'm still here, you'll lose, me in, you'll lose me in about five minutes. Okay, any, next question then. Hi, Chance Swaim here with the Wichita Eagle. Um, I wanted to ask about testing and us being ranked last in the last in the U.S. in in testing rates. Um, is there something unique here that 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 has put us behind Oklahoma and Missouri, Colorado, Nebraska, or or is it is it less prevalent here? Secretary Norman. The uh, uh, that's a good question. We. Uh, I think it's a. It's mostly about supply chain, um, and the because we we've used everything we've had in the state lab. Uh, we try to stay a, just a step ahead with a few stat labs that we can keep in our back pocket. But it's not like we're hoarding them for a rainy day. Today is a rainy day, um, so uh, I think that uh, the commercial labs. I think the. There, people haven't used, uh, physicians in hospitals haven't used the commercial labs as much as they maybe could have because the turnaround is so slow. It, you know, it wasn't unusual, and Steve, you correct me, but we were seeing five, six, seven-day turnaround. That's right. And, uh, and if, if, it, if it's not particularly helpful in managing a the patient, then why bother doing the testing? So, uh, and I've compared notes with Colorado. I've compared, I just was on the phone earlier this morning with Randall Williams, my counterpart on the Missouri side. Uh, and they they have more supplies, but they're still short. They have just like we do, 15 Abbott uh, devices that we're going to distribute one to, to your town uh, or two in Wichita. Randall has 15 in Missouri, but they don't have any of the test kits and cartridges to run it. So I think it's mostly about supply chain. And uh, right. I'd that, like we've, that's exactly we've got a lot right. of it ordered. 
we, we, we have not had all the supplies to do all the tests we wanted historically, and we're ramping up, and we'll have a lot more testing available next week, and we hope in two weeks, you, you know, an, another uh, iteration of that. And But you got to have enough swabs, you got to have enough medium, you got enough kits. And, and, and so that's what's been limiting us. And as a result, we tested people who are coming into the hospital, which gave us the information we needed to know when you came in the hospital, well, you needed to be under PPE or not. And so if we didn't need it, we can take, stop using it, which was important because we didn't have enough PPE when this started. Started. And we were looking at some pretty frightening numbers. Now, those numbers, then uh, we haven't experienced that surge. That's not to say we can't still experience that surge. If people don't act responsibly, we absolutely will experience that surge or even a magnitude more than that. So it's really important to still exercise personal responsibility as you reopen society. But it's given supply chain the opportunity to build up so we can take care of people. And I know, Lee, you and your team have worked really hard with KDHE around surge planning and where else we can build extra beds if we have to. So we, because of the sheltering, we've been able to do the things from a public health standpoint that put us in a position to be more successful. But when we started this, this process, it started on the coast. And so many of the supplies went there. New York still didn't have enough supplies, right? They were out of ventilators. They were out of people. They were out. Of, so everybody's had different kinds of shortages. And we haven't had enough testing kits because they were diverted to other areas. Now that the testing kits are becoming more prevalent, we're getting a lot more of those in, and I think we're in a much better position than we were. Um, and and as, as for one state to a different state, I don't know if I can account for all those differences, other than to say Oklahoma got ahead of Kansas when they got out of the blocks. Missouri got ahead of, out of Kansas in terms of numbers that the Kansas had, but, but um, in terms of the number of patients. But I think that what you'll see is a lot more testing, a lot more ability to go into communities. And just to come back to what uh, Lee Norman said, for those of the healthcare profession and who work around epidemiology a lot, I can't tell you how important your comment, Lee, about 400 more people to do contact tracing is. That may be the best news I've heard this week. Well, we've, it's an aggressive schedule, um, but I think we'll get there. We certainly we have the training materials and, uh, and the local health departments. We, you know, we, we don't want to lose them out of this discussion either. Uh, matter of fact, uh, to the question about Wichita, we're meeting with the health department uh, with Cedric County today by phone to see if, what we can do to be helpful. Because when we get the test materials in, we will be able to do between 700 and 1,000 tests per day in our state lab. Uh, the, granted, the samples have to get here, or, or we have to have the test uh, platforms available in Cedric County. That's what we're meeting with the folks about today to get to those numbers. Any other questions for Senator Moran? I know we're about to lose him. Senator, were you surprised to see the PPP funding run out so soon? Um, it went quickly. $350 billion uh, turned out to be something that was insufficient to meet the demands. So, yes, I mean, I guess the good news is the program uh, is working. It's making a difference. I hear that from uh, businesses, employees, and their bankers. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, Republicans, Democrats will come together once again, uh, replenish the amount of money that's available. This is an important issue for uh, our economy, like people being able to work and getting a paycheck. It's also an important issue for our health care because it allows people to stay employed and get that paycheck even though they're not, not leaving their home, uh, either because they're working from home or because they have COVID circumstances in which they can't work. So it went quickly. Uh, and to, to, to think that, uh, that we were able to put nearly $4 billion into the Kansas economy, meaning into ultimately into employees' not their pockets because it will be spent, but into their survival, their economic well-being. Uh, that's a pretty uh, good circumstance and, and one, something we don't always see uh, from federal government in doing something that, that seemingly is working pretty well. I, I do need to go. What I would say is, uh, to, to, to sum up my thoughts, I will continue to do everything I can to get more tests uh, to Kansas. Uh, our, we, but at, the, at the present time, the, the uh, Dr. Stites is right. Uh, the, the highest priority is someplace other than Kansas because of the death and hospitalization rates, the prevalence of COVID-19. And so we're competing with places in the country that are experiencing uh, much uh, greater challenges than Kansas. But we will work to increase this uh, availability. As I said, it's, it's a high priority for me in getting the uh, people back to normal is to have tests available. And so in, in addition to that, there's an issue of PPE, the personal protection equipment. In order to do the tests, uh, we need people who can have uh, gloves and masks and gowns. And so that effort continues. 
uh, I would say this, I guess, in conclusion, that uh, we ought to begin. And I had a conversation with Dr. Redfield at the CDC uh, within the last four or five days. Uh, he and I were talking about phase four. One of the things that he highlighted to me is let's not wait to get ourselves in a public health circumstance that is much better than the one that we are in, that we were in when, when we discovered COVID-19. And generally, we're talking about investment in county public health departments, uh, in, in testing, and, and, and also a point that we discussed is don't wait to get our supply chain in a better position than it was uh, entering COVID-19 here in the United States. And I will do everything I can to make sure that uh, we are manufacturing medical supplies in the United States and that we're not reliant upon a foreign country or distance uh, impeding our ability to get what we need. Uh, Americans ought to be making the things that are necessary for our health and well-being and things that help prevent people from dying. And we ought to do it in the United States, and we ought not be reliant uh, the way we are today upon China or Honduras or other countries around the globe to meet the needs of Americans in, uh, in keeping them healthy. So we have a lot that we should do uh, for the moment, but we have a lot we should do to make certain that tomorrow's moment uh, we are better prepared than as a, as a country than we were when COVID-19 arrived in our lives. Senator, thank you for your leadership. Thanks for your support, as always, of, uh, of the state and our community and the University of Kansas health system. Secretary Norman, parting thoughts. Yeah, let me just dovetail uh, quickly on what Senator, and I've been, I've been touting this for, um, since before H1N1 in 2009. We have underinvested in public health in the United States, and especially in Kansas. We're in the bottom decile. We're in the bottom 10 or 12 uh, states in terms of the amount that we invest out of our state general fund. We spend $60 per year per uh, Kansan, and uh, most of the top tier states spend five, six times that. Because you know what's going on during COVID-19? We're investigating syphilis outbreaks. We're investigating um, lead um, toxicities. The rest of our public health mission does not go away because of a pandemic. And uh, people spend more money on beverage and food on Super Bowl Sunday than what we spend per year on each individual cans. And, and it's time to really take a hard look at our funding priorities. And I was touting this even long before COVID-19, and now it shows it, uh, our weaknesses. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Hawkinson, Dana. Yeah. Hawkeye. Hi. I would, I would like to echo Dr. Norman's point, especially about what else we're dealing with besides COVID, but also um, maybe decrease or lack of vaccination for our children and keeping them protected from otherwise very preventable diseases. But I think the salient point was about the protests. You know, we all want to go to patios now that it's going to get nice. We want to go to Power and Light Sprint Center. We want to go to Mass. We want to go to synagogue or to the mosque and, and be with one another and congregate. But right now, in this immediate time, we can't do that because if we do that now, there's a very good chance we won't be able to do that for a, a long time because this will just be even more rampant than it is now. Yeah, and, and remember, you can see Hawkeye in person uh, uh, and during the Jimmy Kimmel show um, uh, this Saturday at, one, uh, at uh, 7 p.m. So. That'll be kind of fun to see you being interviewed. And I want to see you follow Lady Gaga. I, I hope I'm best. still on. I hope yeah, they don't cut I me out. That's right. Yeah. Um, and to all of our listening audience out there, remember that um, you have shown great personal responsibility by helping us bend this curve. That is why we're in a position to take care of people as we are and why we're doing better than many other areas of the country. We've talked a lot and a lot on our testing, a lot of this, but the reality is Kansas is still doing better in Kansas City than many areas. Mm -hmm. And what we have to look at is why. Why did we do better? And we're blessed with a little less density. That made a big difference. But we're also blessed with folks who did the right thing and sheltered at home and maintained social distance. As we open up society, remember, it's still time to do the right thing. Maintain your distance. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Cough into your elbow. And if you're sick, please, please stay home. We'll see you next week.